Dr. Leticia Sassing, uh, who is Assistant Professor of Gender and Contemporary Culture in the uh, Gender Institute of the London School of Economics uh, and Political Science in the UK. Um, she's worked at different universities in the UK and then before that at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Um, so Dr. Sassing's work interrogates the entanglements of sexuality, subjectivity, and the political ideals, the liberal political ideals, often of freedom and justice, um, addressing these as processes of cultural translation, uh, looking both across disciplines and transnational concepts. Yeah. Uh, through her scholarship, she addresses how bodies are differently valued across gender, sexual, and racial lines, and how this is taken up in cultural, artistic, and political practices, activism, and social movements. And an integral part of uh, her work has been an enduring interest uh, in the theories of performativity and discourse. Uh, and of course, uh, that is referring to the work of uh, Judith, Judith Butler. Okay. So tonight we're delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Sabse uh, to talk to us uh, on the topic of gender studies, bodies, territories. Revisiting the coloniality of gender. Thank you so much, Leticia. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for uh, such a generous introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming along. Um, first of all, I want to thank the center um, and Barbara and my red uh, for inviting me. Uh, we were just talking and I was telling them uh, how happy I was to uh, participate in this series, which I see has had a super nice lineup of topics on the question of <coughs> coloniality and decolonization. So <clears throat> I will read uh, because English is not my first language and to keep myself to the 45 minutes, it's better that I stick to my scripts. Um, so as, a, as it is advanced in the in the abstract of <clears throat> the presentation that I propose for today, my idea is to reconsider the coloniality of gender as a notion in order to explore feminist mobilizations of the metaphor of bodies as territories in contemporary Latin America. So I will start, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> by revisiting Latin American decolonial and non-binary approaches that highlight the coloniality of knowledge that informs medical and ra racist constructions of gender, and taking as a point of departure the notion that the body is a somatechnical assemblage, um, I will explain that later, I will then try to elaborate on the connection between the gendered colonization of bodies and the coloniality of power at, place, at play in the logic of femicide and transcide in Latin America and feminist struggles against it. So before I start, I want to highlight in particular uh, and I want to state in particular, I would say, that I'm very grateful for this invitation and for the willingness to generate conversations among scholars who do not necessarily <clears throat> work in the same fields, but most importantly, that who might not necessarily have confluent views within gender studies. Uh, this is a gesture that demands us to be generous um, with others and, is one that it invites us to decenter ourselves and be open to question our own modes of knowledge and as gender scholars. And I think I wanted to emphasize this because I think it, this is most important today when the sense of uncertainty and threatened futures that characterizes or our neo-authoritarian contemporary times is tempting so many to entrench themselves in what they think they already know. So I think that in this context, this openness, this openness that these conversations might bring about is a great possibility 
for feminist critical scholarship to remain politically relevant. So in the spirit of decentering the key notions with which we work as scholars working on gender, one question to start with may be, what does gender mean? How is gender understood within gender studies? And in particular, what is the understanding of gender that is put at stake when we refer to the coloniality of gender? As you may probably know, the coloniality of gender is a notion widely taken up by queer, trans feminist, critical race, post-colonial and decolonial scholars, in great part indebted to Maria Lugones' work. Maria Lugones proposed this notion of the coloniality of gender in an article published in 2007 called Heterosexualism and the Colonial Modern Gender System. And I will speak about this particular formulation in a minute. But in order to frame what I am going to present, what I want to emphasize here is that gender does not necessarily figure in the same ways when the notion of the coloniality of gender is mobilized. Not to mention the plurality of understandings of gender within gender studies more broadly to which I'm going to refer later as well. So we have already a complex problem of translations and temporalities here, insofar as one of the premises of the notion of the coloniality of gender is that gender is a colonial formation. The problem, or not the problem, the issue that is open for us to discuss maybe, is that this idea of coloniality of gender being a colonial formation not necessarily means the same thing. So sometimes by this, it's meant that in the first place, the sex gender system as proposed, for example, by Gail Rubin in her groundbreaking essay, The Trafficking Women from 1975, was in fact a European system imposed on the colonies. The implication being that gender did not belong to the colonies and their systems of knowledge. This is one of Maria Lugones' main claims in this first articulation of the concept of the coloniality of gender. Hence, Lugones' effort to find in originary cosmologies the sites from where to contest the power relations implied by the gender system as she deconstructs the naturalization of its hegemonic, heterosexualized and binary organization. Lugones underscores the fact that the sex gender system was an European creation and one that when inserted in the colonies did not work in the same way for the colonizers and the colonized. This is one of the major points that she makes. And it is at this point where she claims for the absolute necessity of bringing in race into the analysis of gender. But the point that I want to emphasize is the following. Lugones in that article writes, biological dimorphism, heterosexualism and patriarchy are all characteristic of what I call the light side of the colonial modern organization of gender. And later she states, as global Eurocentric capitalism was constituted through colonization, gender differentials were introduced where there were none. So in this article, the argument follows by Lugones drawing on scholars such as Oyeronke Oyewumi, Paula Gon Allen, among others, where they, in their investigations, they try to show that in different societies, be it the Yoruba society or Native American societies, reproduction was not organized necessarily along the lines of gender. And it was not necessarily the subordination of females in every aspects of life that 
organized relations of power in these societies. And Luanes draws on these authors mainly to show that the organization of reproduction, as I said, along the lines of gender, was specific to the European society, but not others. It is important in this sense to highlight that Lugones' notion intervenes and troubles the concept of the sex gender system, the one that I was referring to with Gail Rubin, which remains quite central to feminist theory. For we need to take into account that Rubin's elaboration is based on a critical reading of structuralist anthropology, more concretely, the work of Claude Levi Levi Strauss, where he precisely is trying to identify what is universal and sui generis of the humankind that makes it be what it is. That is, what is the hinge and the chiasmus between the natural human animal and the cultural becoming of the fully human humanity. And he finds, Claude Lévi-Strauss, that this key element is the incest taboo and the consequent exchange of women as objects between men, taking sex for granted. In a way, Claude Lévi-Strauss was saying in the early 50s that not only phallocentrism was universal, but also was what it made us human. Problematic, eh? And this is one of the main points of critique in Rubin's essay. But in the second place, in other instances, the idea that gender is a colonial formation indicates that this very sex gender system is the result of colonialism and continues to depend on coloniality understood as a condition of our historical present. That is the, referring to the colonial conditions of our world and the continuity of the imperial of imperialist projects after formal decolonization of most, but not all of the world. And I gather that because of the uh, serious themes, you have talked a lot about this, so I will not in depth extend on that. But here, the implication in this second interpretation of the coloniality of gender, the implication is that rather than being imposed and therefore not really belonging to the colony, gender, as we came to figure it, would not be thinkable at all if it not were for the colonial encounter by which the structure of Western with white Euro European modern modes of knowledge and social organization is actually formed. That is, for instance, not just that the notions of femininity and masculinity attached to the gender binary and their internal hierarchies and exclusions are traversed by whiteness, understood as a paradigm, as if these were already existing constructs in Europe that were then imposed on the colonies, but more poignantly, that the modern sex gender distinction on which the gender binary is sustained cannot be thinkable outside coloniality at all. At this point, decolonial feminist perspectives, such as the one of Julieta Paredes, a Bolivian indigenous feminist activist and scholar, or Rita Segato, a feminist Latin American anthropologist working in Brazil, concur with the work of black feminist scholars such as Orton Spillers, who already in the late 80s made a strong case to show that reduced to flesh, black women were excluded from the field of gendered bodies. And this is a point that Lugones reiterates in her article of 2007. But it also concurs with the work of a number of trans scholars who relying on this genealogy also show how gender was one of the vectors that facilitated a racist colonial project as Riley Snorton does in his history of American gynecology and the concomitant medical plantation in his book, Black on Both Sides, a Racial History of Trans Identity. 
which is from 2017. In this chapter, Snorton tells the story, the history of how the emergence of gynecological knowledge depended on the use of black women bodies just as flesh, deprived of any sense of humanity and on which to experiment with their technologies, surgeries, and so on, in order to produce gyne gynecological knowledge using these bodies with use as flesh as lab species. And pardon me for the brutality of the depiction, but this is how brutal the emergence of gyneco gynecological study and knowledge was. Focusing on indigenous women, Paredes, and in more general terms, also Segato, argue that the symbolic inauguration of sexual difference between male and female humans is an inaugural violence that depended on and continues to depend on the constitutive e exclusion of indigenous populations and indigenous women in particular from the realm of valuable human life. It has been the violent entanglement between whiteness and the sex gender system emerging from the colonial encounters and slavery that produced gender, a category that, uh, was, <clears throat> that then was only proper to white women and to some extent men, the only ones who were deemed to be recognized with a human body and not just flesh. So we have so far at least two different, two different takes on gender, each implying different problems of translation and their associated temporalities. For while both interpretations of gender as the colonial formation share the understanding that not only race, but also gender has worked as a dehumanizing vector operating at the core of the genocidal logic of slavery and colonial power, they differ in their genealogies. While one interpretation seems to suggest that the gender binary system is intrinsically European, or European, modern European in its origins and then imposed in the rest of the world, the other points at the mutual co-constitution of this particular sex gender system, suggesting them that this gender system or gender is already a category that emerges in translation. In the first case, it is understood that gender is translated into the colonies in a way that reshapes the lives of the colonized. In the second, as I said, gender as a notion in translation emerges out of the relationship between the metropole and the colonized. But the problem is more complicated though, for in order to make these interventions, both interpretations have to mobilize gender as a category of analysis. And it is this use of gender as an analytical category that has emerged in the North Anglophone sphere that allows them to elaborate a critique of the gender binary system as a colonial formation. So you see the paradoxical situation I am pointing at here. I mean, the bifurcation gets complicated insofar as an analytical frame, framework and category of analysis, gender becomes the key word for a feminist epistemological and also decolonial project that nonetheless is indebted to, if not belonging to, the field of gender studies, which, as I have just suggested, originated as such in the North Atlantic West. As an analytical category, gender poses at least two further problems of translation. As many times, gender, an English word, is at odds with the forms in which gender has been articulated and theorized in other places, in the past and today. But also because, more often than not, Anglophone centers of production and circulation of knowledge from the North reinforce the hegemony of just certain feminist genealogies and associated conceptualizations of gender, as well as understandings of this field of studies, which in fact 
has developed in very different ways in the South, in the South and other logospheres. The epistemic violence tied to this logic is not over despite the so-called decolonial term. As Brené Mendoza, a feminist decolonial scholar from Honduras, but educated and working in prestigious uh, institutions in the US points out, this is evidenced when the works of scholars of color is caricatured as identity politics positioned as stated, that is superseded by more sophisticated and very often white theories or qualifies as the women of color feminism as opposed to feminism proper and segregated. This epistemic violence is also at play when in its politics of cita citation, scholars mark the existence of these other voices, but override their contribution to theory, and when works written by third world or global south scholars is deemed unworthy of translation or becomes known only after first world global north, many times in the diaspora scholars have already introduced them. Drawing on Dwen Sachi, a decolonial transfeminist scholar, I would propose that both as an object of study, the gender binary or the study of gender relations of inequality, for example, but also as an analytical framework, gender works as a political fiction. A political fiction that emerges as a compound of a number of fields. Clearly, of course, the biomedical disciplines, along with the legal, educational, psychological, religious, criminology, the field of sociology, demography, and public policy making, but also aesthetics and philosophy. And I will like to note that it would be a mistake, as I have just suggested, not to include with this mix of disciplines that make up for the notion of gender, to include our own feminist discourses on gender, attached as they are to the coloniality of knowledge. By conceiving gender as a political fiction, Gwen Sachi, following Paul Preciado, another trans scholar um, originally from Spain, means not just, as Foucault would put it, that bodies are inscribed by social meanings. Sachi points out that, is it, that it is not so much that the body is a privileged site of subjectivation or the biopolitical focus <clears throat> of forms of regulation, but rather their emphasis is put on the fact that these fictions, this, polit this political fiction of gender are somatic. That is, they take the form of life itself taking distance from a humanist conception of the body structured by modern notions of nature and organic, organic corpus, here Soma already exceeds the human. It's about life, organic life. This is more so within the contemporary somatic political regime which Preciado characterized by, and I quote, the emergence of the medical psychiatric notion of gender, the proliferation of technologies that intervene the body's soma, surgery, implants, transplants, and the chemical separation between heterosexuality and reproduction, the pill. Give me a moment because I see that my computer is unplugged and it's going to die. <laughs> 
Ik end. Are you? Can you follow me? Okay. Yep. Everything good. Everything good. Yep. Thank you. So continuing with Sachi and this idea of gender as a political fiction. From a decolonial or rather anti-colonial standpoint, standpoint, Duen Sachi concurs with this line of inquiry, this post-humanist line of inquiry, but underscores the coloniality of the present and past somatic political regimes since the <clears throat> 15th century, producing as part of this what he calls pathogenic fictions. So gender is not only a political fiction, but also a pathogenic fiction. Thanks to which, Sachi states, gender was separated from sex. Looking at the colonial and post-colonial orders of classification of the human and the non-human natural world in Argentina, Sachi states, and I quote, sometimes the representation of the visible resembles more a collective delirium than a positivist ideal of objective classification of forms and entities. The positivist ideal is an eugenicist delirium. The question that Sachi demands us to ask is, what is the value of a post-humanist approach to gender like this when taking into account that such somatic political fiction is tied to the coloniality of gender as a dehumanizing and genocidal practice? How is the medical psychiatric notion of gender developed from the mid 19th century on related to the coloniality of knowledge and more specifically to the colonial formation of gender that has left colonized population, populations genderless, punctuating to this day the hierarchies and boundaries of the human within the coloniality of being? The figural force of penetration or incursion seems relevant here. In the contemporary somatic political regime Preciado is thinking about and by which we can understand the body and gender as a somatechnical assemblage, gender becomes prosthetic, says Preciado, penetrating the body and becoming soma itself in myriad ways. And he states, and I'm quoting Preciado here, technologies enter the body to form part of it. They dissolved in the body. They become the body. Pharmacopower acts through molecules that become part of our immune system. From the silicon that takes the form of breasts to a neurotransmitter that modifies our way of perceiving and acting to a hormone and its systemic effect on hunger, sleep, sexual excitation, aggression, and the social codification of our femininity and masculinity. Preciado graphically emphasizes, the success of contemporary technoscience consists in transforming our depression into Prozac, our masculinity into testosterone, our erection into Viagra, our fertility slash sterility into the pill, our AIDS into ART therapy, without knowing which comes first, if depression or Prozac, if Viagra or an erection, if testosterone or masculinity, if the pill or maternity, if ART therapies or AIDS. Contemporary society is inhabited, Preciado says, by subjectivities defined by the substance or substances that dominate their metabolism, by the cybernetic prosthesis that various types of pharmacopornographic desires that direct the subject's actions and through which they turn into agents. So within these pathogenic fictions that are part and parcel of the 
present and the history of the Soma political landscape where gender is produced, penetration also evokes the enterprise of the conquerors and colonizers entering and appropriating the territories, the lands, the resources, and peoples. The entangled work of cultural penetration from the Jesuit missions in Latin America or Abya Yala, a matrix of penetration indeed, to the Creole or Criollo wars of independence, followed by the penetration of an ongoing and ever-changing imperative to modernize these colonized societies since times of the formation of the national Republican states, which were oligarchic in nature, throughout the different somatic political regimes that have traversed this history, the penetration and occupation of bodies and territories have acquired manifold forms. And this does not deny its continuity to them in the most brutal ways. Asachi reminds us, the Museum of the School of Natural Sciences of the National University of La Plata, the capital city of Buenos Aires, still harbors approximately 10,000 bone remains of people, corpses from military campaigns, private incursions, and the museum's own expeditions, which were exposed in multiple displays at the museum until as recently as 2006. By the way, <coughs> organization of originary peoples had successfully demanded that these and other similar exhibitions were taken down and the remains restituted to their communities. But the point here is that there are infinite trajectories that account for the pathogenic fictions that have appropriated and occupied bodies to render, to render them inhuman, just flesh. Just flesh pure soma. Moving forward, Rita Segato, the feminist anthropologist I mentioned earlier, records that in El Salvador, between 2000 and 2006, during the process of pacification, the rate of homicides of men increased by 40%, while the, while, while the homicides of women by 111%. In Guatemala, between 1995 and 2004, the increase of homicides of men was 68%. The homicides of women increased 144%. In Honduras, between 2003 and 2007, the increase of homicides of men was of 40% while the homicides of women, 166%. So confronted with these numbers, Segato notes, and I quote, the predatory occupation of female and feminized bodies increases in line with the expansion of modernity and markets as they seize new regions. Again, <clears throat> similar spatial figures that evoke the mutual entanglement between the appropriation, exploitation, and murderous violence executed on bodies and territories, shaping the process of colonization and in the context, and sorry, also contemporary neocolonial, neoliberal extractivist economies. So it is not difficult to see how the coloniality of race and gender as dehumanizing practices which survive colonization helps us to make sense of contemporary feminicide and intensified violence against mostly women from the plants, so to speak. The notion of feminicide by, is, was coined by Marcela Lagarde and it's aimed at emphasizing or highlighting the political dimension and orchestrated dimension of femicide while pointing to the lack of appropriate response by state authority. So in this sense, 
at a distance from femicide. Feminicide redefines femicide as a state-sponsored crime. Again, in light of this data I just listed for you, Segato argued that we are living a war against women, whose logic is explained by the expressive function of this gendered violence, what she calls the pedagogy of, of cruelty. In her view, these systematic rapes and killings are not so much sexual in character, a form of exerting sexual domination, but rather aimed at the assertion of a powerful masculinity, which is addressed to peers, and where women are just sacrificial victims. Paraphrasing Segato, by way of asserting the, the, their power of death, the murderers affirm their belonging to the brotherhood, even deserving a distinguished position in a fraternity that recognizes only one hierarchical organization. What is key for this argument is that in line with the decolonial tradition, Segato understands that it is colonization that made capitalism possible and not the other way around, as Lugones also marks in the quotes that I read for you earlier, and that it is along these lines that she highlights the neo-colonial gender-based violence that comes with neoliberal destructive forces. For Segato, women's bodies are the pivotal locus of the alignment between the coloniality of gender, which is constitutively, constitutively racialized in nature, and capitalist violence or capital or racial capitalism thus equating the appropriation of bodies and territories past and present. In a similar vein, women's movements and especially indigenous women's movements have rearticulated in the context of Latin America this link with their motto, our bodies, our territories. This articulation has a double balance. On the one hand, it does link gender violence to the racial capitalist colonial structure of contemporary transnational neoliberal modes of extraction, accumulation, and concentration of capital, which renders the body of the racialized poor or subaltern disposable, subject to extreme exploitation and exposed to the decimation of their environment and natural resources. On the other hand, it is also worth noting that the hour in our territories, our bodies, is less connected to an individualist possessive impetus typical of the modern subject, note the plural formulation of the hour, not my, mine, than with a different connection, and it marks, sorry, a different connection with the land, punctuating with these hours, the fact that these were our originary people's territories and not the property of an individual owner or a corporation. And invoking the necessary collective status of the land and resources that, that sustains them. The shared practices of inhabitation the, re the relational and non-dissociable unit between lands and collective bodily life. Together with a number of Latin American feminist movements, ni una menos, not one less, the Argentinian feminist mass, mass movement, whose slogan, not one less, and philosophy has extended to a number of cities across Latin America and other parts of the world, <clears throat> has taken up the motto, our bodies, our territories, too. Not one less for grounds this metonymic movement when strategizing actions that link, for instance, sexual and neoliberal modes of appropriation and exploitation, and when conceptualizing different manifestations of gender and sexual-based violence, connecting feminicide with state securitization, 
the impunity of systematic police brutality and neoliberal extractive logics. But they also find in this metonymy an emancipatory cue. In the aftermath of the women's strike of 2017, not one less declared, and I quote, we shouted, ni una menos, vivas nos queremos. Not one less, we want to, to stay alive. We formed a collective body and connected ourselves with the body of the land, in the words of the feminist of Adi Ayala. The, ra the rationale behind this public call is made clear by Veronica Gago, one of the leaders of the movement and also a scholar, when explaining the thinking behind the women's strike that not one less has been organizing for some years. This tool, she says, the, the strike, allowed us to link machista violence to the political, economic, and social violence that results from the complex but fundamental logic of current forms of exploitations, which are marking women's bodies into new territories to conquer. In my understanding, the pedagogy of cruelty that Segato speaks about, and that is clearly at stake here, does not necessarily need to or has to rely on sexual difference or the naturalization of the gender binary, as Segato's views might suggest. This is problematic, not in the least because of the racist basis of the distinction between sex and, and gender, I have discussed earlier. But also because in my view, the exercise of cruelty is not the exclusive province of a masculine position. I do not assume either that the exercise of cruelty's expressive dimension is restricted to the confirmation of a masculine subject only. Rather, I would say this cruelty, which in my own work I, I rework as, polit as a political aesthetics, is exercised for the sake of the affirm affirmation of a form of a white supremacy sovereign mastery that feels threatened by any kind of body that challenges the modern gender binary and the heteronormative hierarchies that sustains the coloniality of power present today. Having said that, I think that this anti-colonial stance is promising. As Mendoza reminds us, and I quote, decolonization, and with it, I would add the project of decolonizing queer trans feminist activist work is not a metaphor for anti-racist, anti-capitalist critiques, nor for critiques of Eurocentrism. To the extent, to the extent that autonomy could be under a cherished world in feminist struggles, bodily autonomy, right? So to the extent that bodily autonomy could be understood to speak in this context about collective self-determination and then the link from mastery and sovereignty, I would say with not one less that the demand for self-determination over bodies, genders, sexualities, and lands are key in this common struggle. Thank you. Thank you.